suspect's confession. Surely we can trust a confession. Why would anyone confess to a crime that they did not commit? It might seem nonsensical. Well, this view is actually shared by some investigators. There is a principle in interrogation. A person will not admit to something they haven't done, short of torture or extreme duress. No matter how long you were grilled, no matter how much you were yelled at, you are not going to admit to something you have not done. However, one of the problems is in the pressure of the interview. Suspects may misinterpret what they are being asked. So far in an earlier video, you've heard about the cognitive interview, which can be used to interview cooperative witnesses. The goal of the cognitive interview is to collect as much accurate information about events as possible. If, however, police believe that the person being interviewed may be responsible for the crime, then the goal of the interview may well change. The goal may then become to get a confession from the suspect. And there is good reason for this. Confessions are very convincing when a case goes to trial. In fact, confessions are actually probably the most convincing piece of evidence that the prosecution can present against a defendant. Cassin and Newman in 1997 found that the presence of a confession resulted in a 73% conviction rate in a fictional trial involving mock jurors. In comparison, an eyewitness identification of the suspect resulted in a 59% conviction rate. And somewhat worryingly, confessions appear to be pretty convincing, even when we probably should not trust them. Cassin and Sukal in 1997 found that a confession enlisted through low pressure on the suspect that is when the suspect testified that they felt under stress but suffered no physical discomfort, verbal abuse or threat, resulted in a 63% conviction rate. While a confession elicited through high pressure techniques, this is where the suspect testified that they'd been made physically uncomfortable by the detective, the detective had flaunted their weapon in a threatening manner, and the suspect said that they felt under pressure to confess. Now this still resulted in a 50% conviction rate. This compared to a conviction rate of 19% when there was no confession at all. So how often do confessions occur and how often are these false confessions? Well, these are very tricky questions to answer. Moston and colleagues in 1992 estimated that between 39 and 48% of suspects make full confessions. But what is the rate of false confession? This is a difficult statistic to know reliably for a whole range of issues. One piece of evidence suggests that up to 25% of cases in the Innocence Project involves a false confession. Bedow and Radulitz in 1987, in their study of wrongful convictions in capital and potential capital cases in the US from 1900 to 1987, found that false confessions played a role in 49 of the 350 miscarriages of justice that they had documented in these cases. Leo and Dreisden in 2010 summarised across a number of studies and noted that the percentages of miscarriages of justice involving false confessions in these analyses ranged from 14 to 60 percent. So these studies show that the problem of false confessions remain a key cause of the wrongful conviction of innocent people. And this is pretty concerning. Research suggests that part of the problem is that most people assume that someone would never confess to a crime they didn't commit partly because people don't really understand the dispositional and situational factors that lead to false confessions. So who would falsely confess and why would they do it? Well, some people are more vulnerable to false confessions than others due to individual difference characteristics that these people have. For example, some people are generally more prone to compliance and suggestibility than others. Other people are highly anxious, fearful, depressed, delusional, or otherwise psychologically disordered, and this makes them vulnerable. And for some, their age, specifically being young, makes them vulnerable too. Good Johnson in 2003 presented an interactive model of the process through which false confessions occur, in which the vulnerability factors, such as the one I've just talked about, were actually involved. The other contributing factors to this dynamic and social process outlined by Good Johnson were contextual factors. These are the nature and seriousness of the crime being investigated, the strength of the police evidence, and the pressure on the police to solve the crime. And also custodial factors, such as the length and nature of the detention and interrogation. But Good Johnson also noticed some support or protective factors that actually help guard against false confessions. And these include the presence of a lawyer or independent person for vulnerable suspects while the interview or interrogation is taking place. 
Now, it's fair to say that these factors can combine to sometimes result in false confessions to crime. Cassin and Reitzman in 1985 differentiated between three different psychological types of false confessions that occur as a function of different sources of pressure. The first are voluntary false confessions, which are confessions given without any pressure. Here the pressure or the motivation, if you like, to make a false confession is internal to the person themselves and reflect a vulnerability inherent in that person. Case examples of these types of confessions provided by Good Johnson in 2003 show a strong association with psychopathology. These types of false confessions may occur, for example, because the individual has simply confused what is fact and what is fantasy. The second type of false confessions are coerced compliant false confessions. These are confessions made due to custodial pressures. So, for example, people make these types of confessions to escape or avoid an aversive interrogation or to gain some kind of promised reward. Consistent with the general tendency for immediate or proximal factors to influence behaviour more strongly than delayed or distal factors, a person comes to see the short-term benefits of confessing as outweighing those long-term costs of being prosecuted and potentially incarcerated for the crime. Recent experimental research by Madden and colleagues in 2013 showed that this tendency to overweigh short-term contingencies in interrogation contexts was stronger in a lengthy interview than a shorter one, or amongst those who simply expected a longer interview versus a shorter one, and was also more present in interrogations about less serious crimes and unethical behaviours than interviews about more serious crimes and unethical behaviours. However, with this type of false confession, fundamentally the person knows that they have not committed the crime. They simply confess to doing the crime to escape the aversive situation. The final type of false confession is the coerced internalised false confession, where the innocent person comes to believe that they have committed the crime as a result of the interview or interrogation. In this case, the person's memory for the event may be changed permanently, or they may be led to believe that they have blocked out the memory of committing the crime. Well, at this stage, you might be finding all of this to be a bit far-fetched. And you may believe, as many do, that people who are not inherently vulnerable would never falsely confess to a crime. One of the most famous demonstrations of false confessions was in a study conducted by Kassin and Keitchell that was published in 1996. They were interested in testing the idea that presenting false evidence to a person who is vulnerable due to a heightened state of uncertainty might result in a confession and this person may well internalise and confabulate their memory for the event. So in their study, they had undergraduate students take part in a study. The students were told it was actually going to be about reaction times. In each session, there were two apparent participants. But in reality, one of the apparent participants was actually a confederate of the experimenter, someone who was working with the experimenter. The participant and the confederate were asked to engage in a computer-based reaction time task. In the main task, the confederate was told to read aloud a list of letters and the participant was to type these letters into a keyboard. After three minutes had passed, they were told that they would swap roles. Now, before the session began, participants were instructed on the proper use of the computer. They were warned not to press the Alt key positioned near the space bar because pressing this key would cause the program to crash and data to be lost. So in this study, at about 60 seconds into the task, the computer ceased to function and the experimenter accused the participant of having pressed the forbidden Alt key. Now all participants initially denied the charge, at which point the experimenter touched the keyboard and confirmed that the data had actually been lost. They then specifically asked the participant, did you hit the Alt key? In this study, the vulnerability of the participant was varied by manipulating the participant's subjective sense of certainty of their own innocence. And this was done by varying the pace at which the letters were read out to the participant. They either had to keep up with the pace of a slow and relaxed metronome, where letters had to be typed in at the pace of 43 letters a minute, or with the pace of a fast and furious metronome, where letters had to be typed in at the pace of 67 letters per minute. The experimenter also varied the use of false incriminating evidence. So after the participant initially denied the charge, the experimenter turned to the confederate and said, did you see anything? In the false witness conditions, the confederate admitted that they had seen the participant hit the alt key that actually terminated the program. In the no witness condition, the same confederate simply said that they had not seen what had happened. 
Now, where there were three key dependent measures. The first assessed compliance. Here, the experimenter hand wrote a standardized confession which read, I hit the alt key and caused the program to crash. Data were lost. They asked the participant to sign it with the promised consequence of a phone call from the principal investigator. If the participant initially refused this request, it was repeated a second time. To assess the second dependent measure, internalization, the experimenters unobtrusively recorded the way that participants privately described what had happened. So as the experimenter and participant left the lab, they were met in reception area by a waiting participant, who in fact was a second confederate who had heard the commotion. The experimenter explained that the session with this new alleged participant would actually need to be rescheduled and then left the area to retrieve their appointment calendar. At this point, the second confederate turned to the real participant and said, what happened? The participant's reply was coded for whether or not he or she had unambiguously internalized guilt for what happened. So they said something like, I hit the wrong button and ruined the whole program. And all of these responses were then coded by two raters who were actually blind to experimental condition. Finally, after the session appeared to be over, the experimenter reappeared and brought the participant back into the lab. And they read out the list of letters that they had typed and asked if they could reconstruct how or when they'd hit the alt key. Now this procedure was designed to provide evidence of confabulation, the third dependent measure. Here they were trying to see if participants could recall specific details to fit the allegation. So they said, yes, here, I hit it with the side of my hand right after you called out the A. After the experiment had truly finished, the participants were all fully and carefully debriefed about the terrain of the study. So what did the results show? Well, overall, 69% of the 75 participants signed the confession. 28% exhibited internalization, and 9% confabulated details to support their false beliefs. These rates varied, however, as a function of the independent variables. All of the participants in the fast-paced condition, with a witness present, signed a confession. 65% of them internalized their guilt, and 35% confabulated details about their false belief. In contrast, in the slow pace, no witness condition, only 35% complied with a request to sign a confession. There's still 35%, and no one in this condition internalized or confabulated. The analyses indicated that the presence of a witness alone was sufficient to significantly increase the rates of compliant and internalized confessions, even in the low vulnerability conditions. Now, although this type of experiment has been immensely useful in identifying the causes of false confessions, there are some fairly obvious issues with this paradigm that were identified by Hassel and Cassin in 2012. The first is that the behaviour that's the focus of the confession is more of an alleged accident rather than a willful illegal action. Participants in this study may have actually been unsure whether they had committed the crime, whereas most people accused of a crime are convinced of their innocence or otherwise. The other problem is that by design, all the participants in this study were actually innocent, and so you cannot compare the actual rate of false confessions with the rate of true confession. Rosano and colleagues in 2005 developed an alternative way of looking at confessions to get around these issues. In their paradigm, participants work on a problem-solving activity while paired with a confederate, which is actually someone working with the experimenter. In this paradigm, the confederate gives the participants some assistance with the problems when the experimenter had explicitly said that no help was allowed. A confession was sought when the experimenter looked at the participants' answers to the problems and confronted participants with the allegation that they had actually cheated. Now, this line of research showed that two commonly used interviewing or interrogation techniques actually increased the rate of false confessions more than the rate of true confessions. And these two techniques were first the pragmatic implication of leniency through minimization tactics. That is where the investigator attempts to lessen the seriousness of the offense by making statements that express sympathy and concern or that offer face-saving excuses for the offense actions and by suggesting it's actually in the participant's interest to confess. The second was an explicit offer of leniency via a deal. And so as I said, these actually increased the rate of false confessions more than the rate of true confessions.
This suggests that using those techniques actually makes the eventual confession less accurate as a way of solving the crime. So this brings us to consider the way in which suspects are interviewed as these seem to be important for the reliability of any confession that is made. <laughs>